Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Pandemic Interview Series. It's great to have you with us. Today I'm talking to Nick Harrison. Nick is in New Zealand. He's a martial artist, an armor, and is currently doing a lot of research into the construction of Bronze Age arms and armor. So thanks for joining me, Nick. Great to see you again. Good to see you too. Now, we've known each other quite a while, and I know that you've studied Western martial arts, and you've taught them. Have you studied other types of martial arts as well? I, st I did judo when I was about 10 for, for maybe a year. Uh, and I started uh, Olympic fencing at 13. Um, so I think the Olympic fencing gave me a, a good solid foundation for doing historical martial arts. But uh, other than that, not really, no. How long did you do fencing? Until I started doing historical fencing. Oh, okay, very cool. And what yeah. weapon did you do? Or did you do all three? Uh, at no point did I do all three. Um, so I didn't start historical fencing until I moved to Edinburgh in the mid-90s. Um, not too long before I met you for the first time, actually. So uh, that would have been 94, 95 ish. Yeah, I think we met in like 96 or 97. Yeah, well, I've been doing it a year or two by then, so I had sort of a clue. All right, cool. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, those were some good times there in Edinburgh. Uh, mm. and Made better by company. Now, you've done quite a bit of work in armoring. And one of the questions I have is, we hear, we see a lot of armor and we hear people talking about armor. But there's a difference between mild steel and tempered steel. Can you tell us what's the difference? Yeah, okay. Um, so first up, a lot of modern armor, particularly in the last 10 years or so, has been carbon steel, tempered steel. Uh, so it's hard, it, it bounces things off really well. Um, and, and it tends to be probably more durable than historical armor was. An awful lot of historical armor, at least in the... Um, up until the early to mid 15th century was, was what we call mild steel. So um, the, the essential difference on a chemical level is carbon and the presence or absence of carbon. Um, carbon allows you to harden steel, to make it springy, to, um, to, to, to get the best out of it. So good steel is an alloy of carbon and iron. And you're saying that up until about the mid 15th century, it was all mild. <laughs> early mid 15th okay so it was all mild but were they able to add carbon to the mild yeah. steel yeah ab absolutely the the pembridge great helm in edinburgh is a carburized helm and you did a lot of research into that process yeah i did a fair um, bit how did you go about researching the techniques that the medieval armors used to harden their steel okay so it was actually born of necessity it's really hard to get good carbon steel sheet in New Zealand. So rather than importing it at massive cost from Australia or Japan, um, I looked into the possibility of carburizing the metal. Uh, Carburization has been an understood process for a long time, um, but I wasn't too comfortable with doing it without finding some kind of historical precedent for the... Um, for, for the process. So I went looking. I mean, pack carburization, I'll give you a bit of background. Pack carburization is simple. You get your metal, you pack carbon around it, you seal the vessel you've put it in, and you cook it for a long time. And the longer you cook it, the more carbon penetrates the deeper into the material. So I found in an early 16th century book called Natural Magic, an almost blow-by-blow -blow description of that exact process. Cool. Um, whereby he says you get um, some items of armor and iron of small value, and you, you put them in a pot full of soot and all the aforementioned ingredients, um, and then you seal the pot to prevent any escapes, and you cook it in a fire for a set amount of time. It's typically vague because it's early 16th century. Um, and then he says, you, you strike it open and dump the whole lot in water. 
and that'll make you good hard metal that will um, what did he say deflect the blows of a poignard um, so I thought well that's absolutely fantastic that is pet carburization in a in a 16th century book talking about putting finished pieces of armor through the process so what we then did was we'd make all the armor in good mild steel 1020 or so uh, and then stuff it into a box full of charcoal powder and chicken feathers and bits of leather and oyster shell and, and a few other things to to both provide carbon and catalyze the process and then we'd bake it at 900 celsius for about eight hours now the often said outcome thing that people say about um, this process is that it only hardens the surface of the metal. But the fact is that the longer you leave it in there, the long, the more, in, the, the deeper it gets. So we took this stuff out and you, you're talking one to 1 1.6 millimeters of steel. And that was hard. That was getting a good soaking of carbon all the way through. Uh, there was no real difference between surface and center. Uh, when we hardened it by, by quenching and then broke it open, the crystalline structure was was homogeneous all the way through. Um, and so, you know, we knew we were dealing with pretty good metal by that point. Um, I eventually, um, when I started working with the university, took it up to them and got them to, to do some, some X-ray spectrography of it. And we, we, we're looking at about, I think the, the piece we started with was a 1020. And we added about 63 points of carbon to it. That took it up to a 1083, which nice. is you know, knife steel rather than armor steel. So technically it was, it was better metal than what it should have been for the job it was doing. Armor tends to come in 1050, 1060. So, um, yeah, we were on a bit of a winner with that. It, it worked very well. It's an extra process in the, the heat treating. So it adds about 24 hours after you heat it up and let it cool down and take it out and then quench it and temper it. But um, the, the, the material it turned out was really good. I think we did a, a buckler for yourself, didn't we? Yes, I've got it. Um, I, I still fight with my buckler. How's it holding up? Uh, it's doing great. Yeah, I, I don't imagine it's changed its, its nature at all since we, um, we put it through that process. No, not so much. You'd mentioned you're working with the university. Yeah. You're doing, you've moved from working in steel to doing a lot of work in bronze. Yes. And you, so you've been working in and researching the practical uses and, and development of bronze armor. Yeah, that's what right. But you started into moving, moving into bronze. Well, I was on a forum one day and I saw a post by somebody saying, hey, can anybody make this bronze helmet? And I thought, well, that's an interesting looking piece of metal. Uh, so I started talking to him about it. And I basically said, hey, that's, that's really neat. What do you want it for? And it turned out he was a university professor who was interested in, well, he was a military historian. And he was interested in the actual equipment that they were using. Um, and so we, got, we kept talking. And uh, over the process of the next, about the next year, we, we, we kind of came up with a research plan um, that he put in for a grant for. And, you know, I didn't think too much of it at that point. It was all sort of talk and pie in the sky stuff. <laughs> Until he comes back to me one day and says, so that research grant I put in an application for, we got it. Um, at which point we just sort of shifted over from, well, I shifted over from steel to, 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 to looking at bronze which is a very, very different material to steel. It doesn't function anything like the same way. Um, so that was, it was one of those happy accidents, really, but I, I find myself really enjoying bronze. It's, it's a nice metal to work with. It's uh, one of those rare cases where an online relationship actually turned out. <laughs> very much, very, very much. I mean, it helps that he's only an hour and a half up the road and not, you know, the other end of the country or something, that would have made it very much more difficult. But um, no, the, the, the armor, the process, it's, it's, it's coming together rather well. I've got some pieces here, if you want me to hold them up and wave them in front of the camera. Uh, yeah, I would love that. I'd love to see those. And I know other people would too. 
All righty, cool. Um, so what, what I've got is a, a breastplate, a backplate, a, a, a single greave, and a helmet. Why only uh, one greave? Because I only had enough metal for one greave. Okay. Um, so we, we, everybody, the, the, most of the planet is on lockdown at the moment. Uh, New Zealand, we're very fortunate. We're actually coming out of our lockdown now, which is really, really nice. Uh, but the lockdown has meant that I haven't been able to get out to the site where I built a replica furnace for the last 10 weeks or so. So I was limited to only the metal I already had in, 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 in stock, if you like. Um, plus, before that, uh, we had an incredibly hot, dry summer, which meant that we were under a, a fire ban for most of the summer, about three months. Uh, which meant that I couldn't operate the outside charcoal furnace to make more metal. So I've got four massive drums of powdered metal sitting in my workshop that I haven't been able to use because of first the fire ban and, and then the lockdown. So what I've had to do was just use whatever I had left of our initial stocks of sheet metal and the, the, the stuff that I'd poured and try and make whatever I could out of that. That's amazing that you're making your own stop working just because I couldn't leave the house. Yeah, it's amazing that you're making your own metal too. Well, that's that's kind of part of this job. Um, we're trying to find out how they made the stuff, um, starting from the very very basics of, of making the metal. Um, I'm really glad it's bronze, not iron. I'm just going to say that straight up because getting iron to smelt compared to getting bronze to melt, they're different countries, you know? So I... Oh, is that your bronze? Pour. This is a failed pour of bronze, yeah. I just gnashed into the workshop to grab it. Oh. So this is what would be um, turning into a sheet. Can you hold that up again so we can see it? Yep. Uh, a little bit higher? Wow, and that would become a sheet of just sheet. flat... But it's, I mean, this one failed because it's got no, no center to it. Um, so I had to re-pour, but I keep all the, all the rejects as well. Um, but this, you know, or something like it with, with, a, with a center to it would have to be hammered out. And I mean, you can, you can probably gauge an idea of how thick that is. Yeah. It's about five or six millimeters thick. So it's up to a quarter of an inch thick in places. Um, and that would have to be hammered out into a, a sheet of, you know, one, one and a half millimeters in order to be useful. And one of the very neat things about bronze like that, even if it's a fell, you can melt it and use it again for something else. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the only reason that hasn't been melted down is because I'm keeping it as a record. Yeah, very cool. Um, this stuff is bronze. Um, the copper melts at just over a thousand Celsius, but I need a uh, half that again on top to get the the steel smelting down. So bronze is, is much more uh, agreeable from that point of view. So um, this is okay, this, this is the grieve wow. at the moment. It's it's the anatomical style. What we're really looking at is southern Italy between about 500 and 300 BC. So all of this stuff is based on finds from the south of Italy, central and southern Italy. Um, so it's an anatomical grieve. It's, uh, it's very springy. If I push it together, it bounces straight back to, to where it started from. And uh, like with all of this gear, we've tried to use techniques that replicate the, the surviving marks inside it. There aren't many marks inside it. Uh, with steel armor, we find a lot of marks telling us what happened inside the metal. But bronze, as soon as you hit it over an anvil, it starts squishing. And all of the process marks inside tend to vanish very fast. So you get, I don't know what you can see there, uh, but you get some around the very, very center of this crease. Right. And a few up in here that are hard to process. And that's it. Nothing really tells you what's going on inside the larger areas of the, the metal. I, I really like that crease down the middle. I really right. like that crease down the middle. I can see how that would support any shots coming to the front of the leg. Oh, absolutely. This is, this is really quite hard stuff by now. Um, I'd say 
I haven't done the hardness test, I will be, but I'd say it's roughly equivalent to a good mild steel. Really? Um, this has been planished about three or four times. So each planishing pass, each smoothing pass, where you're hammering the metal to smooth it, um, hardens slightly the, 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 the metal itself. So without that hardening, it's very, very, very soft. Like push it around with your fingers at times soft if it's a sheet. So if this was used, you said 500 to 300 BC. Is that right? Central and Southern Italy. Rome, the, the story of Rome, Remus and, uh, I just forgot his brother's name. Uh, anyways, what's that? Romulus. They were found in, or they supposedly founded Rome about 300 BC. Is that right? Yeah. So this is pre-Roman and the beginning of Rome. That's very um, cool. A lot of the, we, we took a trip to Italy, we looked at a lot of gear over there, and what we would have been looking at was the, the, the military equipment of the guys who both created and fought against those creators of the initial Roman kingdom in Italy. Wow. Uh, quite interesting stuff. I've got the um, breast and back here. That's, this would be a bit harder to show off. Wow, that's small. <laughs> it's not big, eh? Um, and again, we're trying to, to recreate the, the originals fairly closely. So I think this is one centimeter shorter in its width than the original. But beyond that, it's, it's as accurate as I could make it. It's not big. It covers the upper torso only. There are flaps that cover the side under the arm. Uh, those have been left off this one for now. But it, it's not large. I have a wide belt. That's the only piece of this panoply I haven't done yet. Now, you say it covers, it covers the upper torso only, so yeah, down does it leave the abdomen? I'm sorry? Down to your sternum, so that lowest disc would cover your sternum area. Okay, and that's where the belt comes in to cover the abdomen. Yeah, that's correct. So that's, I mean, you, you know what arm is like. You've got a, a fairly rigid upper torso, and then some kind of hinge or flexibility in the lower torso, to allow you to, to move your body around. Yeah. So the solution was, and this is, this is early, early, early in the days of plate armor. Their solution was a, a rigid upper and a belt for the lower. But they also had an aspis, a big Greek shield, the round fillers. Uh, and that was the main form of defense. All, all of this gear is elite gear. This is the armor of unit commanders, army commanders. This is not common soldiers kit. They'd have had, if they were lucky, a helmet and a shield. Most of the time, just a shield and a spear. So, um, yeah, very, very minimalist on their end. This is our, the helmet so far. Wow. This, is still, this is still unfinished. So I've got, to, I've got to work the crease through the center. I've actually put it in and taken it out two or three times because I wasn't happy with it. Um, I've, got to, I've got to work the crease through the center, and I've got to do the interior um, lining and suspension harness uh, before this one's finished. But again, um, trying to follow what we can guess to be the most uh, likely means of construction. And this one, again, this has been planished several times as well. It's now come out very hard. So I'm quite looking forward to, uh, to seeing what these are like once they're in use. Wow, that almost looks like a uh, cabasset kind of helmet. You know, it's funny because that's exactly what's been going through my mind making it. Is th this is almost like an ancestor for a cabasset. Because uh, it is. I, uh, there was a point where I was forming this, this rim where everything sort of scooped from here out to the side and I thought, it's a cabasset. Yeah. No question. Protect the um, shoulders. Yeah, and again, it's, it's, and it's a style that's been hanging around in Italy for a long, long, long time. So it's fascinating stuff, really. Um, one of the other things about this project is the, um, it's really, for me, not so much for the professor, but for me, this, this project's about the interaction between iron and bronze. Because most of the tools that are used to make it were in iron. Anything that wasn't iron hasn't survived. Huh. The only records of tools we have are iron tools, but they probably had others. 
Um, the weapons that they were using, or except for some spearheads and arrowheads uh, and sling stones, are iron, iron weapons. So I've got these things, which I've been grinding out of uh, metal. I, thankfully, my brief does not mean I have to make the weapons in exactly the same fashion as we think they did, because uh, that would be probably a bit beyond my skills. But these wee guys I'm grinding out of, um, of, of steel plate uh, so that I'll be able to use them and get a good idea of how they interact with the bronze. Um, we want to know whether this, this bronze gear was really effective armor or whether it was just for show. You know, oh look, there's the commander over there on his horse with the, steel, with the metal on him. Um, there, it's definitely got defensive p potential, but I on against this i honestly don't know how great it would be because this is an evil little tool yeah <laughs> the photos are really nice yeah oh it's, they're beautiful and choppy really <laughs> really so especially this big thing here which to me feels like a cavalry weapon it's just yeah, you I, the way i've always thought of a focada is it's almost like an axe on a handle yeah yeah this that's the axe head Massive bulb of percussion here, eh? So I'm going to be um, I'm going to be casting handles onto the uh, onto the steel here. Looking forward to that. So I'm, I'm making waxes. This is currently got the holes drilled, but they're all full of wax at the moment. Um, and I'm making waxes to go over the handle area. Get that into the frame. Making waxes to go over the handle area here, so they can all get shaped up and and formed into little horses' heads and all the rest of it. Again, trying to recreate ones that we've seen. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's coming along very interestingly. I've got another year to 18 months on this, probably a bit less than 18 months now. So uh, we're starting to actually write the thing up, which is my, my main, main task at the moment. That's cool. Now, from your research and your practical experience of making these pieces of equipment, how heavy is bronze armor? Not. Um, this stuff is not heavy. Okay. Um, this greave weighs about a kilo, maybe, maybe 900 grams. It's light. So if that's worn on your lower leg, you're hardly going to notice it's there. Uh, the each of the front and back plates of this breastplate weigh about a kilo each at the most at the most um there are small cast clasps and things to go on but they're not going to add too much weight um this helmet which is the heaviest of the of the, the single parts at the moment is about 1.5 kilos so just under three pound. Wow. It's not yeah, heavy gear. So much lighter than steel armor. Well, yeah. And again, I mean, with steel, there's a certain amount of mass that prevents you from receiving damage. And there's a lot of deflective surfaces going on. This, this is all about those deflective surfaces because there's not really a lot of mass there. And if I... Hit the bronze with this, yeah. I mean, it's it's very pierce resistant, but I can't see the bronze standing up to too much punishment from one of these for long. Yeah, I mean, we'll be testing that, so the opportunity to smash up all of this gear exists. Looking forward um, to that. I was hoping to get you down to do it next year, but I mean, COVID's going to have more of a say about that than I do. Uh, but all the same, it's it's going to be a very interesting moment when we start actually <coughs> throwing blows at this bronze gear. Now, because this armor was for elite soldiers, not your everyday, your your rank and file, if you will, um, they th this armor wouldn't have been used in formation. It would have been more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of um uh, fight or when the melee started because this was the heroic era when yeah. so um, 
I don't really think, despite using like the, the, the big round Greek shields and everything, I don't really think that they were fighting in massed formations with this kit. When we, um, when we look at the tomb paintings from Paestum in southern Italy, um, there's an awful lot of guys on horses in armor. They don't have stirrups. Um, they're holding spears overhand if they're, if they're, if they're pic pictured fighting at all. Usually they're pictured coming home to their woman folk after fighting. And that's very important, I think. Um, but on the whole, I, I would say that you're talking about more of a Homeric kind of fighting where it's one-on-one, -on -one, single combat. I see you across the field, call out a challenge and, and set two. Rather than um, what we really think of Roman combat with the massed, massed ranks and everybody wearing the same gear, I think in the period certainly of this hammered armor, we didn't have that. Um, now, with this stuff, there are things I can't talk about yet. Yeah. You know, we are currently edging very, very close to that. So I'd just like to leave it saying, saying this, that um, we're almost certainly, from my point of view anyway, dealing with single combats over large numbers of people. That the fighting style relied on the shield much more than the armor. Um, in terms of primary defense and that spears were definitely your, your main form of combat the swords that I'm making are secondary arms very cool and I know you've got um, documents that you filled out that you're not able to talk about them. so we'll leave it as soon as they're published it's green to go but until I do that or until the professor does that I, I can't that's really exciting uh, so let me move on to another question then. If you were able to build any kind of bronze equipment that you wanted to, and you had the energy and the time and you could do whatever you wanted, what would you want to build? I'd get my legion of slaves to start making huge sheets of metal because I'd love to make some cataphract armor. What is that? Cataphracts, you know, the, the Byzantine cataphracts, the very early heavy horse. Um, often the horses were, were armored in bronze scale. Um, that'd be pretty cool. Oh, bronze horse armor. Yeah. That would be super cool. Big horses. <laughs> you need very big horses. <laughs> so let's talk about preparing the uh, metal. When you're... Yeah. How do you go about, tell us what you can about how you go about preparing the you metal. Get you get big hammers and you beat it lots. Um, making sheets of bronze is hard to do. Uh, making, okay, so this helmet from here to here measured in a straight line is about 11 inches. So it's 22 inches, 23 inches over the whole thing. The sheets of bronze we started with were 12 inches wide. So I had to hammer sheet by, uh, to stretch that metal out by about 50% because uh, I have taken trim off it as well uh, on what we started with. That took so much more effort, so much more energy, so much more time than actually forming the thing up. So, yeah, sheeting it is, is a huge task. So that's where the minions would come in then. That is, that is where your legion of slaves come in. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we've got some pretty good imagery from, uh, from Greece particularly of the guys who used to, to work the bronze. Uh, it's mostly on, on cups and vessels because they like doing that sort of thing. Um, and it shows big, strong guys. They're Greeks. They're always showing big, strong guys leaning on two-handed hammers with very specifically shaped heads. And uh, the chances, it seems to me, that those are the guys who are working with good, strong, pulling regular hammer blows to pull out what effectively a cowpat of metal 
into a, a thin sheet that can then be worked into a vessel. Um, so that's, that's, that's a huge amount of time and labor required to get that far. I bet, and having to just stretch it that much. Um, yeah, I could never have done that with steel, not without yeah. a power hammer. Um, I, I, the difference is with steel, I could have done it hot, but all the bronze has to be cold worked. Yeah, yeah, because it's got a much lower melting. And it loses heat so fast. If I try and, and heat the bronze up, by the time I've got it from where I'm heating it to the anvil where I'm going to hammer it, it's lost its heat already. So there's, there's not a lot of point in doing that. And um, so it's all cold worked, which, you know, that adds a whole another level of, uh, of, um, of process to it because yeah. it work hardens. So it's cold worked, it work hardens, which means you've got to regularly take the, the stresses back out and make it soft again. Only right at the end, when you're done making it, you want something that's work hardened. So there's a, a certain strategy or a tactic towards stopping the softening process and hardening it up and not going backwards at that point. You know, there are points in, in, in all of this armor, there are bits that are really, really, really hard to get a hammer into once you've formed the other stuff around it. And if you've heated it, Getting in there to work harden it again is an absolute nightmare. So I have, I mean, I always had a lot of respect for the old guys who did this. I have vast amounts more now. Yeah. Because they, they, they knew their stuff and they understood the, the processes required to turn it out are far better than I ever will. You know, they, 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 they were good at this stuff. Really good at this stuff. Lots of trial and error. Lots of trial and error and an absolute need to do it. You know? Right. And we get this with HEMA too, eh? You know, our lives are never on the line. True. True. We're not fighting for our honor or just to live. Yeah, I mean, back then, it was a common outcome that your life would be on, on, on the line of your skill. Um, and so we have so many arguments that seem superfluous sim simply because we can never actually test them it's like that scene in the seven samurai you know oh i would have hit you oh you reckon eh? yeah would you want to try it with steel swords then <laughs> yeah yeah you know what i'm talking about yeah speaking of swords mm. you're making all this armor do you also do or have you attempted to do bronze weapon the only bronze weapons I'm planning on doing at the moment are spearheads and arrowheads. Um, swords are high-end gear. And I'm, like I said earlier, I'm really thankful that I don't have to produce the, the steel swords in the same, to the same exacting level of process refinement as I do the bronze armor. Um, so... I may, by the end of this project, be at a point where I'm able to cast a, a bronze sword. But I can't say that that will happen until I've actually had to go at the spearheads and the arrowheads and, and all the other things that I've got to put together first. Um, the needs of the job come long before my desires in terms of what I'd like to create. Uh, if it were left up to me, there'd be so much more shaping and f fancy bits gone into this bronze because it's such lovely malleable workable stuff you know um but i've got to stick to what they were doing so what i'd like to do some bronze swords we don't actually have any from the period we're looking at it's all iron all right so that's what i'm making that actually brings up some things i wanted to show you and this is one of them there we go that's better Oh, yeah. So there's the, uh, the full dagger. Oh, yeah. And so it's got the lip for the but hand. But there'd be an handle to that. And it's got a lovely, you can see the yep. use and the sharpening and the damage yep. here along the blade. 
and the thickness, the way it comes down to the edges. Nice section to it. Is that a single piece or is that uh, set into a handle? No, it's one solid piece and it has these lips to put yeah. a, a horn or wood or bone into. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Nice. So there's dagger I like when I have student or when I have people come visit. How does it feel in the hand? Oh, it's got a really, so this way, holding it here like this, mm. it, I, don't, I don't like the filling on here, but if yeah. I turn it sideways, my fingers fit right there, <laughs> and yeah. it just sits right just, in your just, hand yeah. for fighting with and sticking people with. You know, this yeah. is a short murder stick. There's no fencing with this. No, 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 no. It's not what it's about. No, this is about getting in and shanking them like a prison yard. Lovely. So there's Little Dagger. And when I have people come visit, you know, I, I'll talk to them about history because so often history is taught and it's boring. So I put this in their hands and I say, now you're holding a 3,000-year-old knife. Yeah. This, is, this history is not boring. This is something that you can wrap your hands around, if you will. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I wanted to show you this. And having that failed bronze, you could still potentially make something like this with oh, yeah. if, if it didn't work with your armor. Then the other one is this little bronze arrowhead. That's a peach. Yeah. In your research, did you see them with this kind of shaft? No. Uh, what we found are molds. Okay. Haven't found any arrowheads yet. So they yeah, this is a... out there, but the bronzes are really recyclable material. Yeah. I think you know why we don't have too many tools made of it surviving. Uh, where the only stuff that really survives is in graves because otherwise it's been recycled. And the last thing I have is this I picked up at a store at a at an uh, antique or um, uh, estate sale. I don't remember which one, but a bronze spear. Just some fun little bronze bits now this one i didn't do this so please don't hold me accountable for it. say, it's a shame some beggars mounted it on a piece of wood eh? exactly you can see the pin right there mm -hmm. they actually nailed it on and they put a hole in the spearhead to mount it mm. but these are a few of th these are what i have of bronze and i wanted to share them with you because of your experience with all of this well, thank you. Yeah, I, I wish I could see clearer in the camera. Um, yeah, I like the little knife though, it's nice. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece. Yeah. This, this is the spearhead I was telling you about, and you were saying you're not sure if it would be real. Oh, it's so hard to tell, isn't it? I, you know what it, what it is? It's the fact that it's not very clean. Okay. The surface is, is rough. And mottled and uh, yeah, as opposed to that. smooth. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time on it. It's been polished. You know, um, if you this is this is the thing that bugs me. You see it a lot with uh, with fakes, is that they think, oh, it's old. It's got to be crude, right? You know. But it was not crude. It was immaculately pr created because time did not equal money back then. You know, time equaled quality. Right. And if you're going to take the time to make something, you're going to make it to the best of your ability and you're going to make the highest quality you can because that's what you might get paid for if you're not doing it for food and lodgings.
Right. And if you are doing it for food and lodgings, you're going to make the highest quality you can so that you keep getting food and lodgings. And we today get this, uh, we, we don't, but a lot of people out there have this idea that if it's old, it has to be less quality than something new. And um, I mean, that, uh, that, that very pitted and, and almost damaged surface, yeah. the result, yeah, it could be the result of spending years in an acidic environment. But copper's not very yielding to acid, but steel is, you know? Um, or it could be the result of doing a really casual pour and not taking care with your, uh, your, your, your initial cast. And, and honestly, mate, until I see it, I couldn't make a, sh make, make a comment for sure. I do know that I have not seen a single piece of verified historical bronze work that isn't a minor work of art all by itself. Yeah. That's the truth. Sure. I mean, look, I hate to be, I hate to be the guy who disappoints and I could be dead wrong. You know what? No. And, and I got it because it's cool. Old or not, it's still a bronze head. Oh, it still looks cool. You know, so, this on the other hand, is a different story entirely. That's, that's the real thing. No yeah. question. No. Uh, I, I had somebody say to me one time, if only it could talk. No, no, I don't want to hear what it has to say if it could talk. <laughs> yeah, not, you wouldn't understand the language anyway. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> not too long ago, I got a chance to talk with Robert Brooks, Bob Brooks, about some work he was doing with a university near him. Yes. If I remember correctly, you had a chance to do some work with him and his research as well with Auckland University. Well, when, when this bronze project kicked off, um, about two months before it all sort of went hooray, um, I brought Bob down to New Zealand to teach some, some workshops on Mesa and Longsword. And he brought with him um, so the bronze swords that it were one of the bronze swords that they were using for the Newcastle Uni stuff. So he he presented a seminar at Auckland Uni uh, about that work that he was doing, about how the, the methodology came together and, and the way they um, the way they tested the bronze weapons to to, to find the information they did. Um, but beyond that, we didn't really work too much on that side of things. What I would, would have liked to do, what I'm still hoping to do, but COVID, is to bring yourself and Bob together here in New Zealand to, to test through this stuff. Using much the same ideas and methodology that he was doing with Newcastle Uni. Um, because, you know, it worked and we need to know. So, yeah. you know, if, if I can't get you down here, and it's not looking too likely, I'm sorry to say at this point, um, if I can't get you down here, we'll figure out some other way, probably via Zoom or something, to, to, to get that input in. But, um, yeah, it, it was really just show and tell on Bob's part and ooh -ah on my part. So I was afraid it wasn't anything more exciting than that. Well, it's a good start. I mean, it really brings everybody together with their different specialties. Because once we start working on the experimental side of what you're building, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, Bob is going to be looking at the use of the weapons, and I'm going to be looking at the use of the armor itself, and the, we're going to combine our expertises together for that. That is, that is the plan, yeah. Um, I mean, the good news is you guys both cross over on a whole lot of levels, but uh, you've got serious specialties that go on in there, um, and so I ho was hoping to play to those. I hope we've had my own ideas, which I wasn't really going to let too much out of the bag about in terms of how they're used and how they function. I was going to, you know, see what you guys came up with first and then show you what I'd already written to see how we, 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 we lined up on that. Sort of as a, a, a cross check on, on our own work. Now that actually brings up a question just that I'm curious about. I saw that grieve that you worked on. Um, do you think they had van braces? 
No. Okay. So with the shield and the spear. That's right. If shield and spear, they wouldn't need man braces. There's also a really, really high chance that an awful lot of this gear was made in hardened leather. I'm sorry, was made in what? Hardened leather. Bod Yeah. Yeah. Um, but after two and a half thousand years in the tomb, hardened leather is not going to survive. It's going to re reduce itself to some colored pigments yeah. lying in the corner. Would this bronze armor have been used at the same time as the linen armor? Possibly. Again, going back to the tomb paintings, um, we don't see them wearing much underneath. Um, we've got around the edges of breastplates and belts, we've got holes for a leather lining to go inside those items. Um, and there are tunics, clearly tunics, not, not, not um, liner thorax, but tunics worn underneath the armor. Got to remember, it's southern Italy and the campaign season was spring summer. Hot. Hot. Now, I'm, I'm sitting here in New Zealand early, early winter, and these bronze items in the sun are getting hot to the touch. If you're wearing um, bronze next to the skin, you're going to get second degree burns really, really quickly wow. on a hot day. So it looks to me, <coughs> just based on that evidence, and, and it's not my area of specialty, that's really the professor's place. Um, it looks to me like they were, this stuff is very, very showy when you're sitting on a horse. You know, you'd be able to spot the army commander a mile off because he'd be green. I mean, it yeah, exactly. Especially when it's all polished up. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of padding going on, you know. And again, um, the, the, if you're using a, a big aspis, which is about four feet across, and a spear, your body is largely protected by the way you use your equipment rather than um, by a, a passive protection like armor. Uh, most of the dents we're finding in this seem, seem to be from stones. Hmm. Flings. Or okay. even potentially falling. Yeah, falling down from above, donk onto the helmet, makes yeah. a little bit. Um, but okay. we don't... I mean, there are a couple of holes, but this stuff's hard to pierce. It resists piercing really almost actively. Um, so it takes a fair bit of force to, to, to pierce this stuff. And where I have seen what are identifiable as sword blows, they have not pierced the armor. Yeah. And then if we're talking in the uh, heroic era of Homer and that, uh, it's not about hiding behind your armor. It's about your skill level and your mobility. And if you have too much, you can't do that. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, but again, this isn't heavy armor, you know? Yeah. No, I'm thinking what I'm showing you is like four kilos. Yeah. It's not heavy armor by any question. That's amazing. Um, but I mean, I think, I think your point about the skill is, is totally valid. Um, these guys were, uh, were, were training from a very young age. This breastplate is modeled off uh, this, this breastplate with this particular sigil in the inside is modeled off a tomb in Paisden of a 17 year old man. He wasn't old. He had the gear. He was clearly fighting in it. Yeah. He died at 17. Well, uh, Alexander the Great was very young when he took off out of Thrace as well. Yes, he was. So. They, did, they, didn't, they didn't hang around, you know. The, but by the time a, a young guy was, was 15, he was, he was a man. He was doing man's things with, with man's tools. 35, 40 years old. Or dead. When you're building armor, whether it's bronze or iron, what do you find the most fulfilling about working armor? Sculpting it. Um, I've, I've been working in art since I was not long out of school. So for me, the, the, the challenge is in taking a, a flat sheet and turning it into a three-dimensional sculpted vessel. 
uh, which is probably why I find bronze more satisfying than steel, to be honest. Um, steel resists that impulse more than bronze does. Bronze almost wants to be sculpted. So, um, yeah, f f for me, it's about the sculpture first. And anything else is, is very much a, a second place. Because you've been in... At least in terms of working it. You've been doing some version of art, whether it's a computer or by hand for a long time now. About 30 years, yeah. 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 And I once heard armor, and I've used the description, it's a tailor in a different, uh, a different material. That's all it is. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, actually, there was a great book written by the, um, the arms and armor curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum um, that, that really lays that out. He, he gives you a picture of, of clothing from, from an era, and he gives you a picture of the armor next to it. And then he points out all of the points of, of, of connection between those two. Then he moves on 10 or 20 years and does the same thing. And this is spread over a couple of pages in the middle of the book. I cannot remember the name of it off the top of my head. I'll, I'll find it. I'll send you a link so that you can, you can have a look yourself and you, you, your watchers can have a look. But it is, I recommend it wholeheartedly. It is... Um, right on the tip of my tongue. It's also a really, really good good read. It's worth having a look at. Sounds great. Uh, speaking of collections, if you could go and see any collection of Bronze Age arms and armor, where would you want to go? I've been to some really good ones. Uh, the where? one I haven't been to is the Met. The where? The Met, up in New York. They have, uh, they have a, a fantastic collection. And some of the really, really unique pieces are up there. So if I could go and see any one, it would that'd, that'd be my choice. What collections it, have you been to? Um, the uh, Villa, Julia, Villa Julia in Rome has a massive collection of Etruscan um, arms and armor. This uh, effectively, in terms of Middle Italy, is Etruscan. Okay. So it's these this this style of helmet. The greaves, the breastplates, yeah. Um, that's an amazing museum. I recommend the Villa Giulia to absolutely anybody with an interest in the ancient world. It's, it's superb. And the other incredible collection over there is down in a little place called Paestum. Uh, Paestum's down towards the toe of Italy. It's not all the way down there. It's actually where the Americans landed in Italy to close off the Second World War campaign there. Um, it's an amazing place all by itself. Yeah, you hear a lot about Pompeii and Herculaneum. Um, well, the third ruined city in Campania is in Paestum. Um, they have a city there that it's all walls about waist high. And um, it was finally abandoned, I think, in about 300 AD after more than 1500 years of continuous occupation. Wow. There are really large Greek temples there which is the usual thing you see on postcards. But they also have a museum on site, which contains the, um, the armor and the arms from the local necropoli, uh, which were huge, like massive fields of tombs. Uh, many of them painted, which is where a lot of our pictorial evidence for what was going on comes from. And I, I totally recommend the Paestum collection as well. If anybody is traveling in Italy and, and wants to look at this stuff, go there. It's worth it all by itself. <coughs> Sounds like an amazing collection. Uh, really? Watching you talk or listening to you talk, I'm, I'm noticing your shirt and you have what looks like a bronze helmet on it with ears. Or is that a Roman helmet? That's, that's the next, uh, next stage of this process is to make these helmets. Um, and we'll be, we'll be trying a few things out when we do those. Um, that's actually moving forwards in time by another hundred odd years. So if this stuff that I've just been showing off is around 500 to 47, uh, 430 BC, then we're moving on between 400 and 300 BC with the next stuff. So this is getting into the very, very early real Roman stuff rather than the Romans' ancestors. So the helmet that you've built now would not have ear flaps. Cool. As it comes. Now, I want to move away from armor for just a moment 
you've been running, you have run several events in New Zealand in the past. Uh, I've been lucky enough to come over and visit you for a couple of them, but you also worked some jousting events, right? Yeah. <coughs> um, it's going back a bit now. Um, when I returned to New Zealand from Europe about uh, 13 years ago, um, there were very, very few large events happening in New Zealand of, a, of an historical nature. Um, there was a regular armistice event, um, and there was a biannual joust uh, down at the other end of the island. But there was nothing happening that sort of embraced the larger larger community of, of uh, reenactment and historical recreation. Um, and I had the opportunity to get involved in one and by a series of misadventures, really, I wound up in charge of it. And uh, I ran it for, for four years. It, it, it was great fun. It was a, a hugely challenging thing to do. But I, I, because of my background in, in effects work, I kind of enjoy that sort of thing. Um, it got rained out twice in a row and that for a, an event of that scale is, is pretty much unsustainable. Um, but that, that put me in touch with a whole lot of, of very interesting people, a whole lot of very interesting perspectives on, on, on historical recreation. And um, yeah, it was, it was fun more than anything Sounds else. Like it. Yeah, and it was good. We, we, we used an area in a little town called Taupo. And it was just basically a huge field. And so we'd turn up a week before the event and we'd, we'd move in and we'd get the water on site, we'd get power on site, we'd get sewage and toilets on site, we'd set up campsites and uh, arenas. We had three arenas usually uh, for, for horses, for foot combats, for single combats. Um, and we'd have, you know, the, the whole nine yards. It wasn't quite what you guys have as Ren Fairs, but it was as close as New Zealand had, had got at that time. Yeah, it sounds like it was a lot of fun. It was. It really was. One of the things I like to do is with people I've known for a while, because I always find it entertaining and it's neat, I think, to tie our relationships in together. So we've known each other for a long time. We met in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, back in the late 90s. What is a memory that you have of something that we've done together? Yeah, okay. Um, the most enduring is one that we both experienced at the same time. Um, Paul McDonald had, had an idea. Um, for what we, <laughs> yeah, you're chuckling. Um, for the, <laughs> which was this uh, big, big uh, get together in a remote glen up in the highlands. And we'd move in and we'd create two camps and we'd have running battles for about a week on the site. That was the plan anyway. And so myself and a small group, we turned up uh, about a week early and we started building bridges across the river and we started setting up campsites and, and preparing the place for the imminent arrival of a whole lot of people. And the day before everybody turned up, it rained. And it rained so heavily that we just, we couldn't move. The, the bridges that we built, we built half a dozen bridges with you know, tree trunks across rivers. And they got washed away halfway down the loch before we knew it. Um, I was stuck on the far bank of the river, uh, which had become a raging torrent within 20 hours before anybody arrived. Uh, and I was there for three days before they could get us out. I saw you on the boat and I'm like, Stevie, what are you doing here? It's like, oh, I've been stuck on this little island down the river. <laughs> You, you would have been a hundred yards from us for three days in the rain. And uh, yeah, we never even knew it. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, I believe you were with Kiernan or close to Kiernan. Yeah, Kieran, Kieran, myself and Chris were, were uh, on, on, the, on the far bank of the river. Yeah. And Guy Windsor was there with us too. He was on the other bank of the river with a whole bunch of other people. And because they were, you know, 20 yards away across the river, I never knew who was there. Um, it, was, it was that bad. Yeah, that was, that was an exciting week, or three days. And then we were rescued by a passing ferry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
and I believe I still have the news article about us being rescued. Oh, good. I'll have to check around, but I think I still have that article. Yeah, I um, I I I, I, I tried to go back and recover the gear about two or three months later, um, but I missed the ferry again. And uh, so I don't know. I guess somebody has grabbed it by now, but that gear, as far as I'm aware, is still sitting in a pile in the middle of Glen Allerdale. <laughs> Either that or some archaeologists are going to be really surprised. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't be the first time either. Nick, it's been amazing talking with you. It's always great to catch up with you. You are so knowledgeable in the creation and the research for the different bits of armor. You were always, you're always fun to fence with uh, and you're just a nice guy. So well, thank, thank you, you for much. taking time out of your day to talk to me. Well, no, it, it, it's a pleasure really. If I don't have to write it, it's good. So thanks again. Until we get to get together, all the best to you and yours. Farewell to you too. I hope I see you here next year. Me too. It'll be fun to do that test. Yes, indeed. All right. Take care. Okay. Farewell. Thanks, Nick. It was great to talk to you again. Please hit the subscribe button below. We have lots of other interviews with amazing people. We also have a lot of videos on techniques in Western martial arts, HEMA.